I want you to take your Bible out with me if you would. I'm going to turn. I am so ready to preach this word. I want to go to the book of John this morning. The book of John today, chapter 8. We are going to have a great time. I would ask you to stand with me. Those of you that are here in this audience, uh, you don't have to stand at home unless you want to. Oh, glory. John chapter 8. We are going to talk this morning. I, I've been sharing stories. I, I think everybody likes stories. And uh, when, you, when you talk about a story, talk about, see, that's, that's what witnessing, you, you're talk, your, your stories when you're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, your story, how God's story, how your story was changed by God's story, his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, I'm going to begin in verse number 2. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And the word says here that, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman called in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? You you understand uh, verse 6 says, they said this, they were testing him they may, that they might have something of which to accuse. And they were, they were setting up a trap for him. So we understand that. But Jesus stooped down. The Lord didn't say a word. He stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Don't you know that infuriated those guys? Verse 7 says, so when they continued asking him, he uh, or when they continued asking him, he raised himself and, up and said to them. Now he, he cut them here. He said, he who was without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those that heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, And saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Where are they at? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What a story of grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Father, I I know the story of grace because I've experienced it myself. I experience it every day. I'm not worthy, but you, through your grace, make me worthy because of your righteousness. Grace is a story that I believe it's going to be a brand new story for some today that are listening, whether in this audience here in the sanctuary or in individuals' homes around their iPads and iPhones, Android phones and televisions, whatever the medium may be. But I believe it's going to be a brand new story for grace for somebody today. Today, those of us that have been saved for some time, we just are here to rejoice and be reminded again, for by grace are we saved. And it's that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. I ask your anointing. I ask your divine freedom in this room in Jesus' name. Amen. You know y'all look good. Somebody shout, I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Glory to God. I love connecting with you every week, whether by um, live online campus or live here Wednesday nights. It's all online. I, I Thank you every week for giving me the honor and the privilege of speaking into your life, being a voice of the, of the Holy Spirit, the Lord, to speak. But if ever a woman needed a friend that morning, it was this woman that we talked about this morning, the adulteress, this woman here in John chapter 8. Kind of give you some background here. Early in the morning, Jesus walked across the deep Kidron Valley And up the steep incline and to the east, toward the eastern gate of the city and into the temple courtyard. And and people were there already awaiting his teaching there in the courtyard. And 
Can, can you imagine what it must have been like hearing Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, expound the deep things of God and just, I, I mean, we, we read the words, on the, but can you imagine the one that wrote the words live there in front of you? Now, they didn't realize that at the time. Uh, many didn't. Now, yes, there were those that did know that Jesus was the Son of God, and they didn't have the scriptures there in front of them. But the key point is, all of a sudden, that the peaceful scene was shattered by shouting men. And here comes these religious rulers, the Pharisees, and, and they were dragging a, a woman with her clothes in disarray, probably half-dressed, and her hair was disheveled, uh, defying and probably resisting them and probably crying and shouting herself. And the crowd would all of a sudden immediately, it's kind of like if, if I'm talking here and you hear a loud noise, all of a sudden your eyes veer to where that noise is. And so these guys, they fling her on the ground, to the ground in front of Jesus, and they begin to make their crude charge. They said, Jesus, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery, and there's no doubt as to her guilt. And there's even some that have suggested that the reason they didn't bring, because see, the, the law was both the woman and the man were guilty of death. But some suggest that the reason they didn't bring the man was that because he was one of their own number who contrived the plot to expose Jesus as a teacher who taught others to break the law of Moses. They wanted to trap him, but that's, that's not what Jesus was telling them to do to break the law. And so the spokesman of this group, they said to Jesus very piously, Moses commanded us in the law that a woman like this should be stoned to death. Now, what do you say? And it was on Jesus' thoughts. But, it, but it, was, it was so cool. Uh, Jesus didn't even answer them. You know, he, instead, Jesus stooped down and began writing something in the dirt. There's been so much conjecture of what was Jesus writing in the dirt. I read one commentator this week, not necessarily specifically what he was writing possibly, but the, the, what it was showing that, you know, he, he wrote in the dirt twice and they were kind of comparing it that God used his finger twice. You remember the, the Ten Commandments were written basically twice on, on the tablet by his finger and, by, and, and the second time Jesus was maybe writing as well, maybe writing the main command. We don't know. But the knowledge of possibly but because there were twice he was writing the law down and maybe saying that, you know, the Spirit gives life. But the law, I've come to, over, I've come to give you grace. The law can destroy, but I've come to give you life and that life more abundantly. Now, of course, Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. We don't know. But if it was just... <laughs> Maybe it was just irritating them. He was writing and said, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you talking back to us? But then again, he said, after the first time, he said, let him that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. He knelt one more time, resumed his writing. Once again, we don't know what he wrote, but we do know that when Jesus looked up, all the would-be rock throwers were not there any longer. And once again, Jesus stood and gazed intently at this woman and said to her, Woman, we're the guys that accused you. And she said, They're gone. There's nobody here to condemn me any longer. And now Jesus said to her, You know what? I don't condemn you either. Now go and what? Sin no more. I want you to think about this woman for a moment. This woman, this is her divine encounter, even though she didn't know it was a divine encounter. This is her meeting with the most famous church leader of the day. There's not a more famous, well-known, well-respected church leader that time than Jesus Christ. And the way she meets him is she is hauled into church <laughs> in the temple when this happens after she's been called an adult in the very act. And this is probably also the last thing that's ever going to happen in her life because according to the law, she's about to be stoned and she's going to die. We don't know for sure if she's married, but she's not going to ever see her. If she has a husband, not going to ever see him again. Don't know if she had kids, not going to ever see the kids again. She's not going to see anything again because now she knows she's expecting to be stoned to death. 
Because stoning was the legal means of execution among the Jews. And if one was proven guilty by two or three witnesses, the Bible says, the witnesses and the people would then throw stones upon the person until they died. I mean, it was, tra- it was a horrifying death. See, the Jewish leaders, though, they had already disgraced the law and disregarded it by arresting the woman without the man because, that, as I've already said, the law was required that both parties to adults to be stoned, and the leaders were using, though, this woman as a trap. So, okay, we got the background. But the Lord's response to their demand for some verdict, it's, it's devastating to their trap. It's devastating to their, 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 these Pharisees and, because he said, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Can I tell you, we're good at judging Jesus even makes it a point to, in, in, in the Gospels to remind us about our judging spirits. I'm talking to Christians now. I'm talking to every one of us because we're good. We're good at prejudging situations like we think we know it all. But the Lord says, you're worried about getting the speck out of somebody else's eye when you've got a big old log in your own. Can the, can the house shout, oh me? You know? This group of proud, righteous men find themselves on the same ground as the woman they are about to stone. And their pious armor has been pierced as each one faces the depths of his own sinful nature. And her life has changed because she learned some things about Jesus in this encounter that I want to present to you today in the next few minutes. She learned three things, and I want to share them with you. First thing she learned was this. I believe you already know this. And if you don't need to know it, Jesus isn't condemning. Come on, say that with me. Jesus isn't condemning. How many's found that out? Amen? John 8, 10 says, when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said, woman, where are the accusers of her? She said, has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I want to tell you, friends, this morning, Jesus is not a condemning Lord. For some reason, we have this picture implanted in our mind that God condemns and we're scared of God. Let me tell you, God has removed the fear that, that he is condemning, but Satan puts it back in us. Now, we have a holy fear of God. But God doesn't say, fear me because I'm going to condemn you. Just the opposite. He is not a condemning person. For some reason, we have that picture ingrained in us that, and we feel that condemnation. Can I tell you, when you're feeling condemned, it ain't God. How many know that hunters hunt? Golfers and sinners Let me tell you, don't be shocked when sinners sin. Because it is, as, it is amazing that as believers we're shocked when a sinner sin. Can I just tell you something? That's what sinners do. Sinners will let you down. Sinners sin. And that's what sinners do. But this woman was a sinner. But Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How many has got that verse to memory in your spirit? Problem is, we don't go on because the next verse is probably just, is just as important. Verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. See, God did not send into the world to condemn the world because as a matter of fact, in verse 18, after that it says we were already condemned. You can't condemn somebody that's already condemned. We were condemned. Problem is, Satan condemns us and we condemn ourselves. For our Wednesday night study that we've been making several weeks ago in Romans 8, remember the scripture we talked about, there's therefore now what? No condemnation of those that are in Christ Jesus. You ever heard this phrase, what part of no do you not understand? Everybody say no. Come on, say no. Now add the second word, no condemnation. God says there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. How many, you're saved, you're in Christ Jesus. Can I see your hand? Those who just raise your hand, it is impossible for God to condemn you because he said you've been set free from your sin. 
In Adam, we were condemned. In Christ, there is no condemnation. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I believe that. Well, don't take my word for it. Open the Bible up and look what it says. It says there is no condemnation. Most of us tend to carry a, a, a condemnation along, but sometimes, most of the time, we read no condemnation as less condemnation because we carry an awful lot of condemnation. If we're honest, Less condemnation would be actually good news, but this is not good news, not even just good news. This is the best news. No condemnation, not less, no. Paul isn't talking about something that, he, that, that comes later. He isn't talking about heaven after you die. He isn't talking about when you get your act together or when you're on your deathbed. He's talking about right now, your real life. If you're a child of God right now, there is no condemnation that comes from God. That ought to make you shout up and down today. He's talking about real life right where you are right now. It happened a millisecond you first got saved. It extends into this exact second. There is not, there will never be any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. It's definitive and it's without qualification. I want you to hear this in the depths of your soul. And Satan tries to put this, well, you're not worthy of it. No, you're not. But that's what makes it so beautiful. God knows us. God knew us. God knows what you're doing yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and he still does not condemn you. I want you to hear this in your soul. The Christian is a person who has been taken completely out of the realm of any possible or conceivable condemnation because it's actually impossible for the Christian to be in a state of condemnation in their relationship with God. If you're a child of God and you're serving him, I don't care what you have done, God says there is no condemnation. And because this is true for those in Christ, you should never allow yourself to feel it. Problem is we all feel it. So where's it coming from? Could this be Satan? (laughs) Could it be? Let me tell you, God's here to touch you and remind you there is no condemnation. If you've given your life to Christ, you are no longer a son or a daughter of Adam. You are not in him, you are not in sin. Those who are joined with Christ are now in Christ. You don't move in and out of Christ based on how you feel from one moment to the next. It's not based on how you feel, it's based on what God has already done. Someone say it with me. There is therefore what? No condemnation. So how could Jesus say there is no condemnation? Well, when we give our lives to the Lord and receive him as our savior, we're declared not guilty. Everybody say not guilty. And the problem we find with that is that we know we're guilty. (laughs) But when we say we're guilty after salvation, we're in essence calling God a liar. Well, I'm guilty. No, you're not. Well, I know I'm guilty. I did that. No, well, what? What'd you do? Well, I did that sin. God says, what sin? God, I remember when, that's a problem. We're trying to remember something that God has already forgotten on our behalf. Now, to say God can forget it, he does not choose to remember our sins against us any longer as far as what the east is from the west is what he says he isn't condemning you jesus isn't condemning you he uh, it's and jesus wasn't condemning because he wasn't surprised by sin because sin or sin your sin never surprises jesus and when he took your sin on himself when he hung on the cross he bore judgment for every single sinful action attitude issue that you have ever had and your sins don't surprise jesus why Sin or sin. Sometimes we get all out of war. This world, that's what this world is. But Jesus can change every life. But as a Christian, you are free from condemnation. Jesus paid it all. He rest in his grace. Rest, somebody hear me this morning. Rest in his goodness. Rest in his grace. Rest in his forgiveness. He is not going to stone you, so don't stone yourself. It got quiet there. Let me say that again. Do y'all believe this? The Lord is not going to stone you, so why are we stoning ourselves? If we've placed it under his blood, that's where it should be at. There was a little guy shouting, was shooting rocks with his uh, slingshot. Anybody, anybody ever had a slingshot? Remember Andy Griffith's story, the uh, Opie, he shot the bird. Remember the three little birds? Y'all remember what their names were? Blinkin', Winkin', and... 
Not, hey, see y'all? Yeah, come on in to Griffith fans. But this little boy was playing with his uh, slingshot. He, he returned to grandma's backyard and he saw her pet duck and on impulse he took aim and let it fly. The stone hit the duck and the duck died. He was dead, he was gone. And the boy panicked and hid the bird in the wood pile only to look up and his sister was watching. And so after lunch that day, grandma told Sally to help with the dishes and Sally responded, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today, didn't you, Johnny? And she whispered to him, remember the duck? So Johnny did the dishes. What choice did he have? Because for the next several weeks, he was at the sink often. Sometimes for his duty, sometimes for his sin, she would say, remember the duck? She'd whisper when he'd object. He was weary of the chore, and so he finally decided that any punishment would be better than wish washing more dishes. <laughs> so he confessed to his grandmother that he killed the duck. This is what his grandma said. She said, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing. She said, I love you and I already forgave you. I just wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave out of you. You see, Johnny had been pardoned, but he thought he was still guilty. You know why? Because he listened to the words of his accuser. I'm challenging you as the body of the believers today. Stop listening to the accuser. You have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you shout amen? amen. Secondly, not only is Jesus isn't condemning, but secondly, Jesus isn't compromising. She said, where are your accusers? She said, no one. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. But then he said, go, and from now on, sin no more. He wasn't condemning, but he wasn't compromising. Can I just remind you today, we do not, we will not, cannot compromise this book right here. I don't care how much people say they're okay in doing what they're doing if it's against this book. I don't care what they tell you, that they make all kind of marriages legal. Marriage is still, in God's eyes, husband and wife. I don't care if they say it's okay to hold grudges and be, be fine with racism. God says we're called to be in unity. Come on now. I don't care if they say, well, it's okay to kill a baby, even up to almost uh, the uh, birth. Let me tell you, God says thou shall not kill. There's some things I don't care. Well, you know, it's okay to live together. We're just checking things out. No, you're in sin. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, and, and <laughs> you know as well as I do, we've made things compliant and sound better. Well, we're just living together. You remember what they used to call it? Shacking up. You know, that sounds much better, living together. Let me tell you, God wants to bring you out and set you free and bring you into wholeness with him and do it his way and you'll see and be defined as the blessed of God and God will do greater than you could ever imagine if you trust the Lord with all your heart and not compromise what the book says. Now, that, that's just one thing. Well, you know, I, I, I got this thing, this is, I, and God will overlook. Let me tell you, God won't overlook anything. Only way he overlooks it is if we say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all the righteousness. I just thought you said God is not condemning. He's not, but he's also not compromising his book. He's a holy God. He does not ignore, excuse her sin. He acknowledges her sin, but he came to save sinners. Understand this. When he spoke to this woman, she heard Jesus say, I'm not like those hypocritical men who only care about condemning you. I care about you and I forgive you of your sin, but don't get back into sin. Go. Don't be, don't be committing adultery anymore. If she was married, basically say, go and stay with your husband. Can't sleep around and still Expect things to be right with you and God. Come on now. Don't, don't be quiet. I'm telling you the truth this morning. You can't, you can't do what the world does and still expect God to do what he does in your life. We have to live holy before the Lord. 
God does not put a covering of, 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 of uh, permission on, well, we've got permission on this sin. No, you don't. God says, though, if we confess our sins, what? He is faithful and just. So verse 7 and 8, when they continued asking him, he said, who is without sin among you? Let him cast the first stone. And so we're, we're, we try to gloss over. See, there are some sanctimonious sins in the house of God. We put judging under those permissive sins. We can put disunity under those permissive sins. We can put racism under those because the church has, over the years, in places, thank God I was not raised that way. Hallelujah be to Jesus. You can patty cake, but that's okay. It's true. And God is restoring. God is reviving. God is going deep within. And he is getting some ugly stuff out of the church. And he's calling us to be what his call is on us as the sons and daughters of a most high God unified. God does not condemn, but he does not compromise. Those who heard it being convicted of their conscience, they began to throw the stones down. Here's one thrown down. Here's another. Come on, somebody. It's time to put our stones down on the ground again because none of us are worthy to judge and stone somebody. Well, I saw. I, you this. You this. You this. And let me say, well, what about me and you? None of us are worthy to condemn anyone. Those who accused the woman were convicted by their conscience and they had nothing else to say. They began to go away one by one and they were all guilty from the oldest to the youngest. And when Jesus was left alone with the woman standing, God said, son said, where's your accusers? None. So I don't either, but I'm not compromising. Now stop what you're doing and live for the Lord. Come out from among them and be separate. Rest in his forgiveness, but... Rest in his truth as well, that there's a new life he's called us to live. Jesus is not condemning, but Jesus is not compromising. Lastly, in closing, Jesus is compassionate. Aren't you glad for the compassionate love of Jesus Christ? I don't condemn you. He's compassionate. Matthew 9, 36 says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. And he said, do you understand that when this woman is brought in front of him calling it adultery, do you realize the only emotion Jesus felt for this woman was compassion? He was not angry at her. He just felt love for her. He was moved with compassion. That's why he did what he did. Even though they were trying to trick him and kick her to the ground and get her involved and, and judge her and stone her so that they could crucify him, but he's moved with compassion. And he won this woman's heart with compassion. She was never the same again after she met Jesus. Anybody here, you've never been the same again because of the compassion of Jesus Christ? She was completely guilty as we were. She was carrying this load of guilt as we did, and sometimes we still do, and that sin is on our life, knowing that death is looming. Spiritual death was looming for all of us, but thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory, whom the Son has made free. Later in John 8, you find it, has been made free indeed. She was complicated life filled with lies and, 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 and the ugliness of her sin and sleeping around, but the Son of the living God, who does not condemn us, when she was brought into his presence the word says neither do I condemn you go and sin no more it's the same thing that he told 100% of you watching me right now he said neither do I condemn you because where the blood of Jesus Christ is there is righteousness there is peace and there is wholeness and there is freedom to live whole completely whole before me she was guilty terrible sin but no worse than any other sin. Death is the natural reward for sin, but something stopped that whole process. No, not something, but someone, and his name is Jesus. He stopped the scheduled execution of the woman without lifting a finger or saying a word. He took that broken, condemned, friendless woman, and in a few moments, turned her into something beautiful. I don't know how many of you might remember this old song, but Bill Gaither wrote a chorus years ago I used to sing. Simply says, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. 
But he made something beautiful of my life. He's always doing that every day. Susan, would you come? Making something beautiful. Satan has almost kicked you and and tricked you and defeated you and he beats you, he condemns you, he frightens you and he enslaves you. But Jesus said, you stand with me. He is here right now and he looks at you to say, I don't condemn you. I know you've sinned, but if you'll trust me and believe, I'll take all your confusion, I'll take all your sin, all your compromises, and I'll forgive it in a moment because of what I did on the cross for you. Within a few moments, that courtyard was empty. Jesus, the woman, and her critics, they all left. Nobody's there in that courtyard now any longer. You wonder what was left on the dirt? What Jesus was riding there? You know, It's the only sermon that Jesus ever wrote. And even though we don't know the words, you reckon that the words left there were these three words, grace happened here. Anybody ever seen a sign or a post that somebody has engraved and that says their name, Mark, was here. Just to let, on this date, Mark was here. I don't know if you've ever done that. But maybe on the ground could have been scribbled the words, Jesus was here. Grace happened here. It may not have been written in that dirt, but it was written on your heart. When he saved you, old things were passed away and all things became new. Jesus wrote, I was here. Grace was here. You know, you're very thankful for the grace and the mercy of God. What world wanted to do, God changed. And that was the adulteress's story. Before church, I turned over to a scripture and just opened it up. And I, you know, honestly, we all want to hear from God, don't we? We'd love, we, we'd love to say that God said this and, and, and many, 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 many times he has said this, said something to your heart that you knew or God took you to a scripture. And I, I truly believe God took me to the scripture this morning. Psalms 87 says, he has set his foundation on the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. Remember, we talked about the gates more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Zion is Jerusalem. God loved Jerusalem. It says, glorious things are said of you, O city of God. Now I want you to hear what, this is, this came after I put all these notes finished up on my sermon for today. This came this morning. But it so connects what I just said. God began to say, list who was born, who was now part of Zion. In these next few verses, you see listed the enemies of Jerusalem. He said, I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me. Philistia too and Tyre along with Cush and will say, this one was born 
in Zion. How in the world can the enemies now be relegated as those born in Zion? Verse number five, indeed of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her and the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord will write in the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion. As they make music, they will sing, all my fountains are in you. So uh, I took one of my commentators out. And don't get worried, I'm not going to preach this by itself. I just want to finalize this with this. If you've ever had a passport, you had to prove where you were born at. You and I have been given a passport as the children of the Most High God. And our passport is not here. We are cities. We are from the heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion. All these that he was writing there were against the Israelites. But God says in future Zion, they so what happened? They're going to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Here's the point. Where sin says you'll never be, grace says I will place you there. And what God has done by grace is place the adulterer there. He's placed, he can place the murderer there. He can, I mean, look at the people that, that were crucified with Jesus, the thieves and those that were involved in so much debauchery. He said, remember me. And Jesus said, today you will be in my kingdom. The point is, I don't care what you have done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you said. Jesus in a second, millisecond can cleanse you and says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus, he didn't condemn. Jesus, he didn't compromise. But what he did do, Jesus was compassionate. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace, your peace, your presence. God, your presence is in this room. If there's anyone in this room right now, God, that has, I'm talking to believers that have continued to kind of spiritually kill themselves, spiritually speaking, the condemnation, the load of past that has already been forgiven and Satan has capitalized upon areas of their life and is condemning, condemning, condemning. But you said, whom the Son has made free is free indeed. The reality is probably 100% of us know what it means to be condemned because we do it every day. God wants to set you free. Whether in this room or whether watching me right now, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus will not condemn you. Past doesn't matter. All that matters is what Jesus has passed. He's already done. And he said, old things are passed away. How do we receive that? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We confess our sins to him. He will forgive us. So I'm going to pray this simple little prayer. And if you believe that you need Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. As I ask everybody in this room, if you don't know Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Would you pray, dear Jesus, come into my life. I'm so tired of condemnation. I need your compassion. I have compromised in so much sin. But today, I confess it to you. I repent, I turn, and I turn to you, to my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just got your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you just got a passport. You didn't have to fill out an application. 
You didn't have to wait five, six weeks to get your book. You've been put in a book. Your name is in the most important book, the Lamb's Book of Life. And no matter what Satan says to you right now, you tell him, talk to him. He says, I'm free. You say, I'm condemned. I like what he says a lot better. Amen. Somebody shout with me, I'm free. I'm free. Thank God, I'm free. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and we're watching online today, why don't you tell us by writing a note there on Facebook? Or if you're watching live on our webpage, there's a button down at the bottom you can click and say, I raised my hand for salvation. We'll be praying for you. Also, as we close, I found out this week, one of our own, our, we love the Patricks and the family members, all the precious family members that um, the matriarch, the patriarch, uh, Nettie and Brother Perry and their, their daughter, their son-in-law, um, Victor, his mom passed away the other morning. Um, and they need our prayers today. Would you lift up Victor and uh, Victor Banzon, his family, that God will just touch them. Could you pray right now for them? Father, I lift up Victor and Bonnie. God, that you would touch them. Would you strengthen them and come around them in a way that only you can do? Grief is its never easy. It's never, but we know she's home with you. Thank you for that uh, testimony that they have. And you're a God that brings grace and mercy and compassion even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Would you be their compassion right now? To you we give the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mean, anybody, you feel like you've been to church today? Wow. I'm enjoying these stories, aren't you? Just a reminder how good God is. I could keep on preaching, but you know, I'll stop. Have an awesome week. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you strength and grace and mercy. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen, amen. I'll see you Wednesday night. Y'all have a good day. God bless you.